Hello. Um, my name is Ruth Vine. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist by background and currently in the role of Deputy Chief Medical Officer with the Commonwealth. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be giving this opening address to uh, the Mental Health Professionals Network um, Conference. Of course, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. For me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And of course, um, that extend that respect to any person of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, a background who may be listening to this talk today. So I might bring up the slides now, if we can. Um, and uh, the, the, the title of this conference was Altogether Better, um, Collaborative Mental Health Care in a Changing World. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes that have been happening in, in my world and, and how they relate to collaborative care. Next slide, thank you. So look, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about Australia's mental health system, which we all live and breathe. Um, I'll touch, of course, on um, most of the audience for this, I'm assuming, um, are people who work within health and who have a particular interest in mental health, if not uh, part of the mental health workforce. I'll then talk a bit about one of the things that's been occupying a lot of my time in, in recent months or even the last year or two, which was the evaluation of better access, which is a very significant chunk of Australia's um, mental health investment. Then touch on the agreement and then go to where to next. So next slide, thanks. When we, when we think about mental health in Australia, um, it's hard not to remember the last two or three years and COVID and the impact that that may have had. But, but even if we go pre-COVID, we know that there were a lot of concerns about Australia's mental health system and about the mental health of Australians. Um, our, our system is made more complex because of our federation with different responsibilities being shared between the states and territories. But, but before COVID and during COVID, we had a number of um, really important bits of work and plans and reports that pointed out some of the, the issues in our system and also some of the um, levels of distress and anxiety um, and other um, mental health concerns that people in the community were experiencing. And we, we, I have to say we, as in the Commonwealth where I worked, kept a very close eye during COVID on the number of calls going through to Lifeline or Kids Helpline or Reach Out, and, and they were all pretty worrying in their uh, rises, although, of course, it also recognised that people were reaching out for help. Next slide. Thank you very much. One of the, one of the very important pieces of work uh, that was done, um, amazingly was done, uh, during 2020-2021 uh, was the second national study of mental health and wellbeing. And this is a really important study because it's, uh, it's carried out by trained interviewers using a standardised um, interview schedule that's capable of, of a reasonable assumption at diagnosis. And, and really what it showed was that in many ways things hadn't changed since the last survey, which was back in 2007, in that um, one in five Australians uh, had experienced a mental health disorder in the a mental disorder in the previous 12 months. That was about the same, but, but the thing that was particularly concerning was that 40% of young people um, had experienced uh, that sort of problem in the previous 12 months. There were some particular groups that were at very high risk um, or, or more likely to, so particularly um, women rather than men, uh, as I said, young people rather than older, and particularly 54% of people who identified as uh, LGBTIQIA plus uh, reported having experienced a mental disorder. So th this, this survey provided a deeper understanding of the, some of the challenges that have been faced by Australia. It, it also gave us some information on who was using which services, um, their social and economic circumstances. Um, and perhaps one of the positives, if there is a positive out of this, is that um, around about half of those who had experienced a mental disorder in the previous 12 months had sought support. Now, half doesn't sound like a really great number, but in fact, that was significantly better than the 2007 results. So it, it's sort of, um, it's hard to extrapolate cause and effect, but, but I think what we could say out of this is that people were, we did have, do have high levels of, of uh, mental distress, most often mood, anxiety, um, 
people are by and large reaching out for help, but there are significant uh, parts of the population that um, seem to be experiencing higher levels of distress and may or may not be able to access that help. So next slide, thank you very much. Just want to touch on the mental health workforce um, because when people reach out for help, they most often will reach out to either um, support services or, or clinical, clinical services in both the um, private, public, state or Commonwealth funded sections. And we, we hear a lot about workforce, don't we? And not just mental health workforce, not even just the health workforce. We hear a lot about challenges of, um, of getting the right people in the right place. Um, and, and certainly within mental health, uh, there are, um, I'll come to it shortly, but there are significant gaps in uh, absolute numbers of, of various professions, as well as a maldistribution. So the whole sort of importance of, um, of supporting people and, and trying to um, improve workplace culture and improve the sort of uh, recognition, the person-centred care and people feeling like they're doing a good job is pretty important. Perhaps just as an example of, of some of this, we have a thing called the National Mental Health Services Planning Framework, which is a really useful tool to try and plot the type of workforce you might need for a given, a given population. And in 2019, the, according to that planning framework, there was a 32% shortfall in mental health workers compared to the target. And, and it, it was expected that that shortfall would increase if the if we didn't if we didn't do something about it, and the largest relative gaps were for consumer and carer workers. Now that that's it's a larger relative gap, although it's a much smaller workforce and it's an it's a growing workforce. But also um, there was a shortage of psychologists um, as well as nurses and others. Um, next slide. Thank you very much. So this just gives you a bit of a, um, a graphical sort of display of, of where we've where we've got sh shortages. I'm not sure if you can um, read that if it's too small for you, but basically the top one shows is the general practitioners, then psychiatrists, then going down to registered nurses, which is the biggest workforce, but a very significant gap through psychology, OT, Indigenous health workers. And then the second big one is the vocationally um, qualified mental health worker, again, a really important uh, part of our workforce, providing um, support, particularly in the community and probably particularly in relation to NDIS services. So um, th there's shortages, but we also know during COVID that our workforce experienced quite significant distress and, and particularly psychological distress. Um, there was a quite, there was an important survey that um, canvassed healthcare workers and up from that I think about 62% reported experiencing anxiety during COVID, 58% reported being burnt out, feeling like they weren't bringing value to their work or they were, you know, just couldn't get the same um, enjoyment and satisfaction from their work. Um, and in particular, I think that affected doctors and nurses who had increased rates of um, depression and suicidal ideation. So there were also sorts of disruptions to workforce and, and all of those roster changes, not only those people who um, had COVID, but of course the impact of having to work in COVID affected environments. One of the things that the department funded for workforce during that time was the Essential Network or TEN run by the um, Black Dog Institute. And, and just to highlight that during, um, from sort of May, 2020 through to January, 2023, there were almost 90,000 people who accessed TEN. So that was um, health professionals looking at the resources and programs via the digital hubs, as well as a very large number reaching out for assessment or even one-on-one -on -one support. So people did um, did and maybe still are have a, have a tough time working in health um, and not and mental health included in that during the last two or three years. So we've got, we've got a difficult system. We've got people who are experiencing high levels of distress and a workforce under pressure. Um, next slide, thank you. So now I'm just going to move to it, as I said, one of the things that's been occupying a, a lot of my time. 
Better Access, people might might remember Better Access came in in around about 2006. It might have been called Better Outcomes back then. But but basically it was a it was a recognition by the Commonwealth Government that um, there was limited access to evidence-based treatment, particularly again for anxiety and depression, and that one of the ways of doing that would be to create an MBS-funded system for a limited number of sessions for people to be able to access um, focused psychological strategies or other psychological therapies um, on referral from their general practice. And over the years, Better Access has changed a bit. We, of course, had additional sessions in relation um, to some disasters like bushfires. Additional sessions were also created uh, during COVID. Um, the, the original six went up to 10 and then that went up to an additional 10 during COVID. They came to an end at the end of um, December along with the other COVID measures. But, but better access was certainly taken up. And, and in 2021, um, an evaluation was carried out looking at better access from a number of viewpoints. I won't go into the detail of that evaluation. It's, it's, it's available publicly. Um, but, but what that evaluation found was that um, in 2021, one in every 10 Australians received some better access service. Now, that could be the mental health treatment plan uh, provided by a general practitioner. And around one in 20 received at least one session of psychological treatment, which could have been delivered by a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, OT, social worker, uh, or, of course, a general practitioner. But, but while that says a lot, it, so, some of the recent inquiries, particularly the Productivity Commission, which reported in 2020, said, well, how do we know that this is being targeted to the right groups? How do we know whether it's having a good outcome or not? Clearly, lots of people are using it, but is it is it working? And so that was the other reason for really looking at getting this independent evaluation. And as it says there, that evaluation was published in, um, released publicly in, in December uh, 2022. It, it um, yeah, just the next slide, thank you. Sorry about that. I'm, so one of the, the things that the Better Access Evaluation did was that firstly, it, it, it combined a number of databases. So it, it, one of their studies enabled us to look across the population at linking people who'd used a Better Access um, MBS item with other things, socioeconomic um, variables like um, place of address, um, uh, income, use of other health health um, items and so forth. We also were able to do some uh, questionnaires of individual users of Better Access, as well as surveys and questionnaires of those who provided Better Access. It was a fairly large sort of consultative forum that happened with a whole range of providers, um, consumers, carers, and others that, that generated a number of ideas. Um, and, and as I said, there was also sort of plotting out who was getting better access, how much, and uh, with what apparent outcome. And basically what the evaluation found was that those who did receive better access, by and large, said it was helpful and they had positive outcomes. And in fact, the more unwell a person was at the beginning of the, the episode of care, the greater the improvement. Um, and, and that was found again and again. But it also found that some parts of the population and some uh, segments within the population were more likely to access better access and more likely to access more of better access than, than others. So um, people in regional, rural, remote areas, those from lower socioeconomic um, areas by, by postcode or, or modified Monash area tended to be missing out, either getting just a treatment plan and no psychological services or a fewer number of sessions. And, and the, the evaluation also found that while better access was initially um, targeted towards those with, if you like, relatively uncomplicated presentations, that over time that, that had changed and people with quite severe, quite complex needs were, were accessing treatment through better access if they could get it. Um, but there were also, of course, a number of barriers uh, for, for um, getting access. And particularly those were um, geography, which I've already touched about, but also affordability. And again, over time, and this was really um, 
even more noticeable in the in the last 12 months so during 2021-22 the gap fee had actually increased in size um, and in the number of services where a gap fee was charged and again that sort of says that this which is a, a, a it's a publicly funded um, psycholo access to psychological services was in a, in a sense being distorted to those areas where um, more practitioners were available but also where people were more likely to be able to af afford and pay a gap fee and so that the, the the workforce shortages that I've just talked about were again getting a bit distorted by by where people were moving to provide services and and I think the um, the, the evaluation absolutely um, it sort of emphasised that better access is good, but it's not equitable and, and it's not equally available to across the population. And one of the very interesting findings, which is I'll, I'll just mention because it was fascinating to me, is if, if you um, look at level of need as measured by something like the K10, then overall in, within the population, there are higher levels of need um, amongst those who, if you like, have lower socioeconomic um, profiles or who live in areas where there's greater socioeconomic uh, disadvantage. Those, those people tended to have higher rates of prescribing of antidepressants and lower rates of access to psychological treatments. Now, now there might be all sorts of reasons for that. There's reasons of, of choice and availability and all that sort of stuff, but it did feel like the more intensive and, if you like, time um, time investment that goes with psychological treatments was again being more available to people in um, in uh, particular areas and not to others. And I think this is d demonstrated on this uh, slide. Next slide, thanks. So uh, look, at, this is a, a really neat graph. As I've mentioned, the greatest barrier to accessing better access probably was that affordability, and, and you can see there the um, price going up, um, or the cost rather going up during 2022. Um, and, and probably if we looked at why people in those lower socioeconomic areas were having fewer sessions, it's not to do with severity. It's probably to do with availability and affordability. Um, clearly the availability of telehealth changed some of this, but, but we all know that particularly for psychological treatments, telehealth is of value, but it's not the whole answer and it's not going to resolve the equity issues um and and i think um the number of new the um, one of the other um areas of, of concern was that with the extra 10 sessions those extra 10 sessions didn't seem to be going to people with more complex um presentation at the beginning it seemed more likely that the extra sessions that you know up to 20 sessions were more likely to be going to go as going to those who could afford rather than need. And there, there, there also may have been a compounding factor there because um, the number of new people accessing um, better access treatment reduced from 56% in 2018 down to 50% in 2021 when those additional sessions were in place. So, you know, I, I guess the conclusion from better access is people are using it. It's great. It's expanded. Um, I'm sure those who provide better access services are providing excellent care and, and, and interventions, but it certainly needs um, a bit of attention and a bit of reform if we're going to say that it is also about improving access across, uh, across the community and, and targeting perhaps those with particular needs. Thanks very much. Next slide. Now, along the, along the, the other time that the better access evaluation was happening and COVID was happening and all of that, we were also in the process of uh, developing the National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Agreement. Th this was, a, again, a really important piece of work and, and, again, in response to a number of reports, but most particularly the Productivity Commission inquiry, um, really, again, highlighting that there is great fragmentation, that different jurisdictions do things differently, that there's been confusion in roles and responsibility, and, and that if we're going to try and bring the system together more and, and make it um, mo both more accessible, but also more easily navigated, as well as address gaps, then it can't be done by one level of government alone. Um, and, and clearly this agreement, which was a bit of a miracle, I think, that we managed to 
get um, get done and get all states and territories agreed, but clearly it will take time. And particularly, again, if we come back to workforce, th there's a pipeline. Things take a long time to get in place. Next slide, thanks very much. So just a, a few of the outcomes that um, we expect from the national agreement, and, and clearly the government has changed. That was the previous government that um, uh, commenced and, and signed off that national agreement, but uh, my experience is that the um, momentum is continuing and that people continue to recognise the importance of this. So I won't go through all of this, but um, clearly some of the outcomes of the agreement were around better data, better information sharing, um, some about better and more standardised approaches of, to entry to the system through more consistent initial assessment, um, a better articulation of the roles and responsibility, and, and trialling some new um, models of care. And I might just go to that now, so we'll go to the next slide, thanks. Um, when, when one of the recommendations from the Better Access Evaluation was acknowledgement that a fee-for-service model doesn't it is it is you know it's, it's great it it's good in many circumstances but a fee-for-service model doesn't always allow the sort of um supports and interventions that people who particularly who might present with more complex problems might need so one of the big emphasis in the agreement is some of the new models of care that are affordable that have a, a, a more multidisciplinary workforce um, and, and that are more easily accessible. So some of these are just beginning, some are, some are sort of well-established, but I'm, I'm just going to talk through them a bit. And th there are three um, main streams, if you like, which I'll touch on. The Head to Health Kids, which is a, um, probably a long overdue recognition of just how important it is for um, young, uh, young children and their families to uh, be able to access mental health assessment and care. The um, Headspace, which Headspace has been around a long time, but during COVID it became obvious that there were quite long wait lists in some places and real struggles in, in attracting the right workforce, and then Head to Health Adults. And as you can see in that slide, the, the common factors of these are that it's targeting towards not the ultra-acute ultra, ultra acute or severe that are so um, you know that, that by and large receive treatment and care in the state-funded systems, but but do involve multidisciplinary teams, a more holistic approach, and not defined by narrow eligibility criteria. Thanks very much. Next slide. So head to health, and um, th these these things are just at the beginning. But we we did have the opportunity to have a bit of an experiment with head to health because during COVID, people might recall that. Um, Victoria had pop-up head to help clinics and uh, they also um, were opened in ACT in New South Wales. But we're, and, and for those of you who are in Victoria, um, Victoria has a sort of different profile because Victoria, as a result of the Royal Commission, has announced and is, is developing um, a whole stack of local mental health and wellbeing centres that are very similar, I think, to the head to health model. Anyway, we've already got we've already got nine of them, and um, I'm, I'm actually went to the opening of one in Canberra um, at uh, about mid Feb, and at the, I think just at the end of Feb, I'm going to the opening of one down in Geelong. So you know they're, they're happening, um, and the 21-22 budget announced funding for establishment and ongoing operation of a whole stack of of others dotted around the country, and the the idea of these is that they're located in places that are easily accessible by their community, that they can be accessed through ringing the um, central number 1800 595 212 or, or by walking in, and that they do provide a mixture of sort of, if you like, support and coordination. Nearly all of them will have a, a, a significant number of peer workers to, to provide that sort of welcome and support, uh, but also access to clinical treatment um, not 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 intensive or forever because these things have to have throughput, but much more flexibly driven um, and with a um, a variable workforce. And the funding model sort of allows for a degree of regional variation to address local needs. And and although um, you know I, th I think these this model is still evolving to to have a flexible workforce that will meet the needs. So so for example, the one in uh, Canberra that I went to recently had 
couple of clinical psychologists, part-time psychiatrist, as well as um, uh, I think I think an OT and I can't remember if there was a social worker and, and several peer workers as well. And you know, so so we're really you know able to respond to different um, needs. Um, then and they also have I hope will all have very strong relationships with their state and territory funded service. Um, the one in Darwin is co-located with the top end acute mental health service run by the NT government. Um, the one in Canberra likewise has a really strong relationship with with um, with the local health service. Uh, next slide, thank you. The the next um, model here just to touch on is the Head to Health Kids Hub. This is much much earlier days. I think um, there's not one fully established, fully open yet, but but there are um, there are some that are on the way, and there will be at least one in each jurisdiction. Um, I think uh, the Kids Hub in, at the, each jurisdiction by 22-23, and ACT and in Northern Territory are a little bit further behind. I think they'll get theirs by 23-24. But again, the idea is that these will complement that they'll integrate well with the state-funded maternal and child health services as well as child uh, mental health services. Um, they'll, they'll be able to offer assessments and, as, as I said, not predetermined by diagnosis. These will need to be carefully watched because there's an, a lot of need out there and we, we know that there's not much point to have something that is not accessible or that you've got a six or 12 month waiting list for. So. Um, these are, again, a very exciting model, one that I'm really looking forward to keeping a really close eye on. Next slide, thank you. And by the way, if anyone can hear my dog shrieking in the background, they're not in pain. If you can't hear them, I'm very glad. Um, the, the next one, just to touch on, is Headspace. Headspace has been around for a long time. There's a lot of them. I think there's 153 um, out there at the moment, of, of which a significant number are located in rural and regional Australia. And, and that it, it's, a, it's very much a primary care model. So Headspace was not intended to care for those with more complex presentations. And, and for many, um, in many places that, that was a real gap, that there was a um, the threshold, if you like, for accessing uh, adolescent mental health services funded through the state was quite high and, and Headspace uh, struggled to, um, to respond to that level of need. So, there is a um, at the moment a rollout of of an of an increase in the funding base for Headspace, and the expectation of that is that it will now enable um, a stronger workforce that will help deal with some of those waitlist problems and perhaps also be able to respond to people with um, with more complex needs. Although I'd, I'd sort of um, be very you know very important to emphasise Headspace is a primary health model. Um, there are, of course, a limited number of early youth psychosis services that are more intensive for particular subgroups of young people, but um, but those there are not so many of those. So again, this this intention is to enhance the um, more coordinated, multidisciplinary care for cohorts of young people, and and hopefully all of these services also provide um, a platform for students, for graduates, for but people in early on in their career to be able to have uh, exposure and work uh, in order to um, grow the workforce as well as grow their experience. So those are some of the things that's happening under the um, national agreement. Next slide, things. I also just wanted to sort of point out that we, we, we do look for what, what other models are happening and, and what, what sort of innovations or um, models of care are, are, are being developed because Australia is not, not alone. We may be an island, but but we share many of the mental health pressures with, with others. So just to mention a couple that in the UK, they're um, improving access to psychological therapies or IAPT um, started quite a while ago now. Um, it's, it's pretty extensive. I'm sure there's um, criticisms of it, but one of the things that IAPT has done is really put in place a, a very robust measure for outcome uh, reporting and, and that enables um, people to compare and contrast outcomes over time and also uh, across areas and and I think you know one of the things we don't have is is a sort of embedded outcome measurement. In New Zealand um, 
it's uh, relatively new, the Access and Choice Program. And the model there is to actually place mental health practitioners, clinicians and support workers within existing general practices. And, and again, a really strong part of their model is that you'll get a same day appointment and they, they do a lot of sort of single session, goal focused um, interventions. But if you need more, you can, you can get more. So they're really trying to have a strong focus on availability, immediacy, so opportunistic availability, um, as well as a focus on being culturally and socially appropriate. And then one of the things that's happening in Australia, um, developed by Beyond Blue, is a thing called New Access, which is it's effectively a sort of um, uh, a mixture of face-to-face -face and online coaching um, to individuals who present with um, mostly sort of mild, mild problems or particular life stresses or workplace stresses. So I think it's important to recognise that there are um, other, other things happening. And I think the final slide, thank you. So um, to sort of round it up, I, 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 I try very hard to remain an optimist in my career. I, I have to say things go up and down a bit. Um, you're never quite sure if you're heading in the right direction. But I do think, hand on heart, that um, we've, we've got some really important bits of work that have been done that we can build on. So better access being evaluated and now looking at what, what um, either major changes or minor changes might need to be um, made to that to improve it. I think, of course, that sits alongside some of the work in the strengthening Medicare area. Um, but through the agreement, looking across um, state and territory and Commonwealth funded services and also how, how funding models, like how salaried services like the Head to Health platforms might fit alongside FIFA service, um, MBS services is happening. Really, I think, acknowledging that sometimes multidisciplinary care is important. Now, that's not new. I mean, community mental health centres have always been multidisciplinary. But of course, they, over time, their availability has narrowed and, and thresholds have become quite uh, challenging. So, so trying to sort of loosen that up. And, and I think, you know, as I said, to use, think about workforce all the way and think about balancing placements, expanding people's interest in mental health um, and, and really a, a sort of thinking what is the right workforce and are we using people to the best uh, of their skills and ability. So I know uh, reform will take time. I'm sure we'll talk about many aspects of that uh, during the Mental Health Professionals Network um, conference. Thank you again very much for inviting me to be part of it. And uh, I, I wish you a happy conference. Thank you. Goodbye.